we're never what we think people. We're never as bad as we people think we are. We're mm-hmm. never as great as we, mm-hmm. people think mm-hmm. we are. Good point. So, so we just need to keep ourselves in perspective. And I think again, going back to what I would say to my younger self, keep yourself in perspective. You're yeah. not what you think you are, and uh, and I'm definitely not what I thought I was. Right. <laughs> you know. Yeah. And I think that keeps us humble. You know, it, it, it's the Lord. Anything that happens. You know, yeah, we have to put in the labor. We need to be diligent to uh, show ourselves a prove unto God, as yeah. the word the word says, but not not take ourselves so seriously. Hey, everyone! Welcome to the Expositors Collective Podcast, Episode sixty two. I'm your host, Mike Neglia, and thanks for listening. On this episode, our special guest is Pastor Chris McCarrick from Cornerstone Calvary Chapel in Howell, New Jersey. Now, if you've been listening for the past couple of weeks, um, you might recognize his voice uh, because he's the guy at the end of the episodes inviting you to come to New Jersey for the next Expositors Collective training weekend. Um, He is hosting us on September 20th and 21st for our training weekend. And, uh, you know, if you're on the East Coast, if you're able to travel to the East Coast, if you live in New Jersey, um, then I really encourage you to visit our website, find out more details, um, get registered and sign up because you're going to get a chance to learn from Chris himself and a great team of experienced Bible teachers and preachers. We want to help you succeed in your calling and your ministry. Now, also in this episode, there's a a special guest co-host, Pastor Riley Taylor from Seattle. Um, If you've listened to the earlier episodes, um, there was one of his uh, main sessions on the importance of like homiletics. And then also there was a a really great interview with him as well. So if you want to hear more from Riley, you can scroll back and find those older episodes with him. Well, anyway... As we have this great conversation in the city of New York a couple months ago, uh, we talk about kind of a lot of things, but mainly the importance of just like steady diets of healthy word-based ministry and how us and our churches, we don't just need spectacular once-off events, but we need that steady rhythm of hearing God's word wisely and timely delivered again and again and again. So in a culture that maybe is obsessed with events or with high performance, one soft um, occasions, there's that real importance in the life of the individual Christian and the church worldwide for just that steady diet of word-based ministry. So I hope you enjoy this conversation and I hope that I see many of you in New Jersey later on in September. I hope that this episode and all that we do at the Expositors Collective helps you to grow in your personal study and your public proclamation of God's word. Enjoy the episode. Hey, welcome to the Expositors Collective podcast. Uh, me and my temporary co-host, Riley. To very temporary. Yes, I'm, I'm glad you're here. We have Chris McCarrick with us. Um, hi, Chris. How are you? Hey, great. Good to be with you guys. Hey, Chris. Yeah. So where are we? We are in New York City, in Queens, New York, and we are in... Uh, the Nysum Building, which is the place where the Calvary Chapel Bible College, Queens, New York, is held. Yeah. And uh, it's a great place. Yeah, we're in a classroom right now, right? Yeah, it's very warm here. We're li- I feel like we're in some sort of basement of some sort of old tuberculosis place where they used to burn bodies or something. Really weird. That's exactly <laughs> what I was not thinking. <laughs> Doesn't it feel like that kind of place, like where it's like the boiler room? And it, it is like it that. Like we are in a basement. There's like big, huge smokestacks. There, in the building. And there are all those things going on, I'm sure. <laughs> I, I'm sure. <laughs> hey, hey, Chris, so I'm, I'm actually stoked to have both of you because, Riley, you just came from our last Expositors Collective yeah. training weekend. And then, Chris, you are hosting our next one. Yeah. So this is kind of a, a hinge. Um, Riley, what, what happened at the last one? Oh, man. It was awesome. Ba- I mean, basically what happens at all of them, which is a lot of young people who are interested or either getting started with preaching and just looking to sharpen their skills or get opportunities. My small group with a, a few guys who had barely preached at all just grew probably by 300 percent 
just by learning the terminology, learning the goal, learning the heart behind expository preaching. And I think that happened for every single person who came every, I think all 150 people. It was, it was fantastic. Yeah. Yeah. I appreciate that. It's, it, it was a good time. It was a good time. Um, so Chris, you are involved in hosting the next one. Why, why do you want to host it? Well, uh, my son, Mike went to the one in, um, Denver. Yeah. Uh, the, was that the first or second one? It was our second one. Second one you had. Yeah. And so, uh, we sent him out there just because uh, I was speaking with Pete Nelson, and Pete was telling me the vision for this. And I always have a heart to see young men, young women get to know the word and, yeah. and be able to communicate it in a more clear way. And I just love the vision. You know, I read about it on your webpage, and I've talked with Pete at depth, in depth about it. He's a talker. And, uh, yeah, he, 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 he'll, he, you let him run, and he'll run. That's good. Um, and so, uh, you know, I, I said, well, let's have it here. On the, we need one on the East Coast. Yeah. And and I said, well, we'll host it. It's that simple. You know, we'll do it because it's, uh, I love the vision. You know, I've been involved in a lot of different things with the Bible colleges and also some discipleship ministries yeah. where you just train young people. And I've, I've found that, you know, you just pour a little bit into them and it kind of just ignites a fire, you know, and, yeah. and to be able to ignite a fire of expository preaching, really great stuff. Yeah. So. And, and, and hopefully that will last for, for decades. Yeah. Come. So it's, yeah. A, it's a short term intense investment that will hopefully be bearing fruit. Yeah. For months, years. Speaking of hosting, we got to host one in the Northwest. Well, that's your problem, man. I know. And so we'll talk about it. <laughs> we will off air. But yeah, just Justin Thomas has already been talking to us. About oh, that, okay. So, yeah. Um, hey, so let, help us get to know you a bit more. Um, what was your first sermon like? How did you get involved in this? Yeah, my first sermon do ever. You, do you remember? Yeah, I do. Uh, I was thrown into it. Yeah. It, was, it wasn't really a sermon. It was a bi- home Bible study. Okay. But um, my brother-in-law was teaching a home Bible study in my home. And it was to, where they take place. Yeah, it was supposed to start at uh, at seven o'clock at night, and he called me at six and told no. me he couldn't come. No. And I was a Christian for six months at the time, and uh, I said, "Well, what am I supposed to do? You can't come." He said, "You do it." And I said, "Do what? <laughs> I don't even know what to do." And I, my favorite passage was John fourteen, and so I went in my bedroom and got on my knees and cried yeah. and said, "You know, Lord, give me something from John fourteen because you know at least I at least I'd read it enough times." Yeah. And uh, I sat down and gave a Bible study, and I started the study by saying, um, you know, Jesus said, you believe in God, you believe also in me. And, uh, and I said, well, that means Jesus is saying he's God. And little did I know that sitting in my, in my living room that day was a Jehovah Witness. Oh, okay. And um, by the end of that night, he got saved. <laughs> and so I thought, well, hey, this is kind of fun. Wow. You know, maybe I'll learn to do this a little bit. Wow. And so I got wow. some training uh, at Applegate Fellowship in uh, just in in sitting in uh, under under the teaching of John Corson and also my my brother in law and a lot of the other leaders there and and uh, really I did most of my stuff by just trial and error you know you just sit down and do it and you know you figure if if a few people come back maybe it's working a little bit and I remember I remember the first sermon I gave in my church okay and that was um, uh, we started it, we had about thirty five people at my first Sunday service. And uh, I preached, and next week there were only like 15. So I figured, yeah, maybe I need to work on this a little bit. (laughs) Well, that touches on a topic that I've talked to a lot of people at the Expositors Collective, just something I try to really um, hit on a lot. Because young people, um, I've noticed, can sometimes turn down opportunities Mm -hmm. out of fear, Mm -hmm. which I understand. But preaching is something that you get better at by doing. That's right. And a lot of seminaries have very few preaching courses and even there's not a whole lot of emphasis on it mainly because it's just not something you learn in a classroom. No, it's true. You can learn how to study. I think a lot, mm-hmm. uh, but homiletics preaching and then just being given the opportunities to do it are so crucial. And you're only going to get those opportunities by saying yes to more op- other opportunities. And so I, I try to encourage people and it sounds like you're just another story, just like mine, just like Mike, that you, you do a home Bible study. You, you speak in the kids ministry, you mm-hmm. do a small group, you, you speak at youth group, mm-hmm. you know, you just give your testimony, do a devotional. It's that's how you improve. Yeah. And we're doing that even in our own church with our leaders. We, we just kind of restarted that and expositor was kind of the thing that got us oh, moving back. Delightful. We used to do this quite a bit. I used to meet with a group of leaders and we would give them a passage and, and say, okay, next week you're you're teaching on five, you know, five minutes or 10 minutes on that passage. Yeah. And we used to kind of do that. And we kind of got away from it for a while and 
part of because of expositors like we said let's start doing this again so we have a leadership meeting on uh saturday mornings every, once a month and and we give a guy okay you're on and you know you're going to speak for 10 15 minutes to the group and you know it's they stumble they struggle yeah. uh, but it's okay yeah. you know because they're among people who love them and you let them stumble and struggle and and you know even maybe be with them and critique them and help them a little yeah. bit you know so and, and you're giving them a gift yeah absolutely it's, it's an assignment that that is work and it causes you you mentioned you got on your knees and you cried yeah sure <laughs> um, but, but that is a, a chance for them to dig into god's word and it's just a chance for them to to have that at the very least that's probably the the, the lowest motivation but it's experience yes i mean and, and there's higher motivations obviously yeah but sure. this experience that we gain from that yeah yeah amen okay so you prepared for that first message by getting on your knees and crying. <laughs> yeah, right. Is that how you prepare for all of your messages? Have, what has what is, what is grown and changed since, since then? Yeah, well, um, in my prep, I, I, I do a lot of um, – I take a lot of handwritten notes. And so I, I compile by both reading, studying, studying the passage. I do kind of an inductive study, okay. I, I, a little hybrid of the inductive study, but I basically use the inductive study. And then I, I accumulate about sometimes 10, 15, even 20 pages, 30 pages of written notes. And some of that is from the inductive. Some of it is from commentaries. Some of it is from word studies. Some of it is from listening to a, a, a teaching of a, of a favorite pastor of mine or something. Yeah. And, I, and I kind of compile it all. And then I take my notes and I put them aside. And I sit and I start to type. Yeah, really? Okay. And whatever I remember... <laughs> from what I'd learned yeah. is kind of what I kind of roll with as far as what the message is going to formulate the into. Stuff. And then I take, a, uh, I sort of just do that on my, on my computer and I take a plain sheet of paper flat out and I write an outline. And then from my notes in my computer and my outline, I kind of mesh them together and I come up with my, you know, and that whole process takes me between it's a little faster today because of the internet and, and word studies and the things you can do. I mean, I used to do it with the books on the table and the whole deal. Mm. You know, now mm. I, it's quite quick. You know, so I would say minimum, uh, minimum of, you know, six hours, probably many times 15 to 20 hours, you know, to do that. So, um, and of course, now having studied through the Bible a couple of times and taught through the Bible completely, yeah. I have notes on every chapter of the Bible, pretty much. Um, and so I, I confess I do cheat with my own notes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I go back and I, I read them. And I even go back sometimes and even listen to my old messages. That is hard to do, hmm. I must confess. Because hmm. hmm. I listen to them and I'm like, oh, did I really say that? You know, But it's actually beneficial. Uh, it, 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 it's actually a really good thing to listen to yourself. Okay, I like what you said about writing all these notes and then whatever you remember yeah. comes out. I think that's a cool workflow in which you are essentially building into the workflow this this authenticity right. with the scripture. Right. That it has to penetrate your heart. Right. It has to get in your head. Right. So it's very easy to copy and paste. Oh yeah. Ideas, quotes, um, points, and they're not really in your heart. It's easier today than ever. Than ever before, because totally. of the internet. I mean, yeah. you can yeah. you can take a topic, put, don't do this, but you can take a topic, look it up in the internet, and you can come up with an outline in a, in fifteen minutes. And so, would you say that there's a reason that you keep that workflow, and you there's a re why why would you say it's so important not to copy? And, well, I mean, what if you're copying and paste the best of the best? Well, like, you know, would you I mean, look, Warren Risby is a guy, right, who's put out these outlines that are, you know, and we've all heard a lot of other people preach Warren Risby's outline, outlines, yeah. and they're great. Yeah. I stay away from them until the last thing I'm doing, if I'm going to read them, because I would be tempted to copy them. Mm. And mm. you said the reason I would do that is because that very thing, I want the message to come from my heart. I want the... I want the Lord to have spoken to me and I'm delivering to them what God has spoken to me. Yeah. Not what, I mean, information is great, right? It can be beneficial to get information, but if it's not inspiration, yeah. then it's nothing. You know, if we don't have the inspiration of the spirit and I think that's where, it, when it comes, I think for me, it comes as I work through that stuff. And as I get to that, hmm. that place where, 
you know, okay, now I've got a clean slate and I've studied it all out. And I, this is what, you know, this is where I am. And now, Lord, what do you want to say? Yeah. What do you want to say today? Because, yeah. yeah. you know, there's a lot of different directions you can go with a given passage. Absolutely. Right? So. Well, well, do you know what? Last, last week, I preached a Warren Wearsby outline. And the way that I landed there was I, I read, I wrote. Um, I have a, an intern at the moment. And then me and the intern, we sat down together. We talked through the passage. We were taking notes. And, and then we kind of lumped into these three different sections. And then I looked at Warren Wearsby. And it was the same. It was the same. <laughs> I've done it. It was the same. Yeah. And so, but yeah, I, I, I tend to save Wearsby and Guzik yep. until the end. Yeah, I make sure. Because I find, I find each of them so quotable, so mm-hmm. easy, so good. I deliberately save them to the end. Yeah. And, um, but, yeah, it just happened that I just broke up. Second Thessalonians chapter two, verse 16 to chapter three, verse five, the same way in the same three headings that, that he did. And I just was like, Oh, cool. Yeah. There and, we go. And Thanks. you know what that Thanks, means? You know what we saw the same truth. We discovered, yeah. you know, we actually, Oh wow. I was right on this one. Yeah. <laughs> Cause yeah. You know, yeah, that it's like simultaneously encouraging. Oh, I'm on the right track. Yeah. While also like, Oh, I'm not original. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, none of us are right. <laughs> none of us are. So, yeah, yeah. Okay, so we kind of talked through a bit of your, your workflow. Um, what would you say now as like a, an older gentleman to your younger self? What do you wish that you knew? What do you oh, wish that you gosh. put into practice 10 years ago, 20 years ago? In relationship to studying specifically or in relationship to oh, preaching you have, you have or like anything. like wisdom for life, I'm Dude, sure we can I, learn from it. There's but, so but much. Let's, I can't, let's focus on the, the studying slash preaching aspects. Well, I think the preaching end of it, I would take myself a lot less serious. Okay. You know, I think... I, I, what do you mean? Well, I think it, I would... I've relaxed a lot in my in my preaching style and in my... Uh, even my, my attitude toward what I'm doing in that... I, like, I used to think, honestly, the sermon was the be-all and end-all of mm. everything within mm. my church. Mm. And if I didn't deliver... You know, it was like, you know, and I've come to learn that church body life is so much more than me preaching on Sunday morning. And, and I, and not that I don't put the same importance on it, mm-hmm. but I don't think I'm as important as I used to be. Mm-hmm. So that's how would you, how would you then describe the role of preaching in body life? How has your understanding of your, of the pulpit's place in that life? How has it been clarified or fine tuned over the years? Yeah, I think, um, I think that I would I would want to say to my younger self like what you what you need to do is to take your help you want to help people to see God in your preaching. Mm. You don't you don't have to deliver you don't have to be the funniest guy. You don't have to be the most dynamic guy. You don't have to be all these things that you think you have to be right. or cuz you listen to somebody else. But you want to help this person who's sitting in front of you see something, some aspect about the Lord and some way in which the Lord can touch their life that day. And, and you know, the three points or all the illustrations or the, you know, the great closing, it, it, you know, it's like, okay, that's good. Yeah. Do it. Yeah. But, you know, I mean, I've had people come to me about a sermon and, and they'll, they'll say, oh, that was a great sermon, pastor. Great, great message. Oh, yeah. So I, a lot, many times I said, well, what was it exactly that, you know, what really spoke to you? Oh, you just got out of the whole thing, you know, you, and you know, they're not really, <laughs> but, but I want to, I, I actually ask them that now pointed. And I've actually yeah. said from the pulpit, if you're going to tell me that, it, it, that you thought my message was great, you better be ready for my question. Oh, okay. Cause yeah. I'm going to ask you what you specifically meant. Cause I want to know, like, and I, not, not to, not for strokes, but so that I can hear that God has really spoken to you. Mm. Have you ever had people at, just so hesitant to answer that they just leave the church oh yeah <laughs> <laughs> sure i mean <laughs> or, or perhaps the, the pleasant comments after the service have, yeah have been more meaningful yeah i mean that's really what i mean to me we're never what we're never what we think people we're never as bad as we people think we are we're mm. never as great as we, mm. people think mm. we are Good point. so so we just need to keep ourselves in perspective and i think again going back to what i would say to my younger self Keep yourself in perspective. You're yeah. not what you think you are. And uh, and I'm definitely not what I thought I was. Right. <laughs> you know? Yeah. And I think that keeps us humble. You know, it, it, it's the Lord. Anything that happens, you know, yeah, we have to put in the labor. We need to be diligent to uh, 
show ourselves approved unto God, as yeah. the word the word says, but not not take ourselves so seriously. Yeah. You know? so. yeah, and it's that probably that consistent week in week out, Sunday after Sunday, cumulative preaching that probably matters more than one good message. No doubt about it. Twenty five years I've been doing this now, yeah. and um, the 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 fruit I see in the person that's been sitting in our church for ten years, and was was saved in our church and now is serving or is an elder or mm. is a, a deacon or is serving in the Sunday school ministry, that fruit is way better than the person who walks out crying that Sunday morning because, wow, what yeah. you touched my heart, you know? Yeah. And, and, and a lot of those people, I had a guy one time, this is a, this is one of those preaching things. You know, a guy comes to me, we had a really small church at the time, 50 people at most. And, and this guy comes and he was, he was from Skip Heitzig's church. And he just moved to the area. Okay. Comes to our Sunday service, he and his family. After service, raving. Oh, this is the greatest thing I've ever been. With. We happen to have somebody cancel for lunch. We had an extra. Come over for lunch. I mean, he and his wife just, they practically worship me. <laughs> and, and he went to Skip Heitzig's church. And I'm like, Skip Heitzig? Like, he says, you're just like Skip. I'm like, well, I don't have blonde hair, but okay. You know, you're just, you know, and he's going into this whole thing. I never saw him again. Oh. Never saw <laughs> him again. Wow. I don't know what happened to him. Wow. I don't know if he moved back to Albuquerque. Maybe he got kidnapped. I, don't, yeah. <laughs> I have no that idea. Must, the point be. is this. That guy was, you know, I, I was the greatest preacher on planet Earth. Yeah. Never saw him again. Yeah. So would I rather have that or would I rather have that person who's been sitting in 10 years and serving and, mm-hmm. you know, mm-hmm. no doubt. Yeah. No doubt. No comparison. How do you preach to that? Because preaching is such a moment. It's such a moment. You know, like I come from a filmmaking world and films you make to have a long shelf life. Replayability, you know, rent it, buy it. But a sermon is so in the moment. Even a podcast is like has a week long shelf life. So it's like, uh, how do you preach the long game and not preach for the moment yeah, pr- moment for the accolades yeah, or whatever yeah yeah i mean I, I i really believe it's the word and the spirit that does the long game you know I, I can get the laugh sometimes and i mean i've had again the people say oh that's funny boy you're really funny today you know because sometimes i'm you know bald guy is funny you know uh, <laughs> i don't try to be but sometimes it just comes out that way and 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 but i don't get it like i don't get excited about that stuff anymore and so i think you know again praying that the spirit of God will really touch their life with the word of God and it'll make a penetration in their life. I think that's, that's where we, that's where the long game happens. It happens because God has done something, not because I've done something, my communication, my excitement, my whatever, what does it do? It might get somebody crying or get somebody laughing. Maybe. Yeah. Cause you know, comedians do that, you know, entertainers, like you said, the film industry, they, you can go to a movie and it can be a weird story, but it can make you cry yeah. because of the emotion and all that that goes on because we're emotional beings Absolutely. and there's nothing wrong with emotion. Nope. It's fine, but we can't, I tell my people all the time, I can change your feelings any given moment. I can come over and smack you in the face and you're going to feel differently than you feel right now. Please don't, sir. And, and, when, and you might this hit me back strong. and then we're both going to feel bad, right? Yeah. <laughs> so the point is we can't live by that stuff. It's, it's the word and the spirit that's working in our lives. And, and that's where the longevity comes in, you know? Yeah. And perhaps you've, you've heard this illustration, but you know, you think of all the meals that your mom has made you as you were a kid, you know, you might remember a few of those meals, maybe a birthday cake, you know, Mm -hmm. but it's, it's that consistent day in, day out, keeping you alive, keeping you healthy. Right. That it's, it's the pattern of like, you know, years worth of meals that have made you the healthy man that you are now. Yeah. Um, not necessarily this amazing three course carefully prepared um setting which is good and we, we want our sermons to be well prepared but yeah we want to have be a life a lifetime of faithful preaching amen is more important than a amen. really good sermon. That's right yeah does that sort of free us up then to not i feel you know uh, in one particular sermon i kind of worry about each demographic and non-believers here or 50 year old, you know, 50 years long Christian is here. How do I touch every single thing? You know, does it kind of, if you're playing the long game, does it go, okay, I'm going to, 
I'm going to preach on, I'm going to emphasize this today, Mm -hmm. knowing that I'm going to emphasize the counterpoint or say the, the point held in tension next week or Mm -hmm. next year, even. I do think it frees us up. I, I think there is an aspect of, you know, thinking of who your audience is that's important. But I also think that, that, that we, we're, we're free to – we can't say everything we want to say in any given sermon, even about that subject. Yeah. You can't do it. If you try to do it I, – I went to a preaching – a week-long preaching school by a guy named Stephen Alford when I was young, very young in the Lord, very young in the ministry. And one of the things he said that stuck with me was it's way better to say one thing seven times than to say seven things. Mm-hmm. Because if you say one thing seven times, people walk out with the one thing. If you take, say seven things, people walk out going, which one, which one of those things makes it's any sense light to dusting me? dusting of truth. Yes. Yeah. Instead of, here's, a, here's something I'm driving home to you that I want to, you, you know, want to, well, I want this to get into your heart. And uh, I, I mean, I'm the guy who can easily do a 10-point sermon, you know, and I, I have to guard against that, you know, because I, I want to give them it all, you know. I, I had a guest speaker recently that's a guy who's been around a really long time and really great guy. But we, both my son and I talked about it and we were like, he tried to give us everything, didn't he? Like, like we knew, like, yeah. like, like yeah. this was his one chance to yeah. preach in a little bigger church for him, and he, he tried to give us everything he had. You know, it was like, eh, well, and he's still good, but you know, yeah, you, you watch that and you think, yeah, you, you can, you can hold it back. And when you're, when you're the pastor and you are preaching every week, yeah, you know, and I've had people come to me after a service and I say, well, you missed this point. You know, you didn't say this. He said, well, I'm gonna get there. Come back next week. (laughs) So, well, that's excellent. Well, well, Chris Riley, thank you very much. I do really appreciate your time. Thank you for giving up the first half of your lunch break. Uh, No problem uh, to be here. I could give up my whole lunch break. It wouldn't hurt me any. (laughs) Ball guy, he's funny. Yeah, (laughs) great, excellent. Well, thanks for listening, and uh, I will uh, see you in September. All right, sounds great. Thanks, guys. Hey guys, this is Pastor Chris McCarrick, and I'd love to have you come out to uh, the Expositors Collective, which is being held in Howell, New Jersey, at Cornerstone Calvary Chapel on September 20th and 21st of this year. And we would we would really be excited to see you come. So you can register at expositorscollective.com, and uh, and we we really look forward to meeting with you. So love to see you there.